Well, not cold, actually. It's a really rainy uh, Friday morning. We appreciate your attendance. Uh, at least it's a good day to be inside. You're not wishing you were outside, so that's bonus there, right? Um, this is the fifth evolution conference, and from the inception, it's been it's been the outreach school. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'll keep going, sorry. <laughs> like I'm hearing myself, very strange. Um, I think I as they make their journey uh, north and hope they're able to Uh, originally, uh, originally, uh, originally, uh, originally. Uh,
Dr. Gary Moore, going to share his thoughts on searching for the Wizard of Oz in the college classroom. Dr. Moore serves as a tenured full professor of agriculture and extension education at North Carolina State University and holds the position of director of graduate programs. Dr. Moore is a fellow or a member of multiple teaching organizations, including the American Association for Agricultural Education, the North American College and Teachers of Agriculture, and also the North Carolina State University Academy of Outstanding Teachers. He has been the recipient of many very prestigious teaching awards throughout his academic career and has also been a presenter or a keynote speaker at many national and international teaching conferences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Moore as I offer him a small gift of appreciation on behalf of the College of Ag and Natural Resources. He has to leave you with Ag swag. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure whose it is. I just <clears throat> well, it's great being here in the West in the bright, sunny environment that we have. Today, we're going to go search for the Wizard of Oz. So I'm glad you're going to go searching with me. And the question is, is the Wizard of Oz in the college classroom? Or is the wizard in cyberspace? Where is the wizard? Several years ago, I was at a USDA conference in New Orleans. And they asked the question, what makes a good conference? And I got to thinking about it. And I think, if I'm challenged to think, that's a good conference. Or if I pick up one new idea, that is a good conference. So those are my objectives today. to so challenge you to think, and maybe it might help you pick up one new idea. Well, let's see the Wizard of Oz, but we need to back up and start from the first. It's a twister, it's a twister. So, you know, that grabbed Dorothy. And then, we must be over the rainbow. Yeah, we must be over the rainbow. You know, we're in cyberspace, things are different. Our first point is we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, our technology's changed. Our students have changed. Now, I came prepared to, to give my presentation. Uh, but, you know, you didn't have that, so I had to go to plan B. Then I did bring a copy of my presentation. Uh, so if anybody wants to download it, no, here it is. But, you know, things have changed. Can anybody identify that thing on the right being loaded into the airplane? That is a five gigabyte hard drive. And that's from the 50s. Now, of course, on the left, we have the 32 gigabyte drives we carry around with us today. When I was in college, I took a course in surveying. I used that device on the right. You know, we sort of use the device on the left today. When I was in high school and learned to type, I used that first one right there. Then when I went off to graduate school, I splurged. I bought an IBM Selectric 2 self-correcting, you know, and that was the hot top technology. Then we've gone to this, now we're to this. You know, things are changing. Now we'll see how old some of you really are. Listening to music. Well, when I first started off listening to music, I had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. That's what I used. Then we went to the record players. Then we had these little 45s. 
Who can tell me what that is? I, I see the people with gray hair holding up your hands. How about some of you young people? Cat, what is that? What is that? Okay, some of you wiser, older, gentle people, tell her what it is. Yeah, see, that has a little tiny spindle. That has a big one for the technology, the jukebox. So you put this in there, and then you can play it up there. No, see. <laughs> now, then we got to the CD players and thought that was wonderful. Yeah, now the students walk around campus with these plugged in their ears. So, you know, technology's changed. When I was in college, my botany professor taught this way. All the different plants there. And then when I went off to graduate school, my department head complained about this newfangled technology, the overhead projector, because he couldn't get this on there correctly. We get the wrong side up. Now, then we also had slide projectors. In the early days when I went to present at conferences, I took a tray of slides. Uh, often in our classes, we take a tray of slides. Then we went to the PowerPoint era. Now we have visual presenters. Now we have smart boards. Now things are changing. Our students are changing also. We're now teaching Generation Y, millennials, digital natives. How do you think my first day of kindergarten went? They didn't even have Wi-Fi. No. That's what we have these days. Well, yes, we could read your blog, or you could just tell us about your school day. Well, these are our students. Time Magazine recently had this on the cover, the me, me, me generation. Millennials are lazy, entitled, narcissists who still live with their parents, yet they'll save us. So, no, we all know that we have millennials. They're tech-savvy. They're family-centric. They're achievement-oriented. They're team-oriented. They attention crave. They want to be rewarded for anything and everything. There's a riding stable in Florida. If you ride a horse, you get a trophy. Oh, I rode a horse. Here's your trophy, kid. No, that's what millennials want. Then we have the helicopter parents. Yes, mother, I told you I'm doing fine on my own at college. Hey, could you log on and find my schedule, order my books, and call me when it's time for class? No, so. Well, this is what it's like. So we're not in Kansas anymore. So the first question I'd ask, is your curriculum and what you teach on the cutting edge? Is the equipment in our labs modern? Is it what uh, we should have? Is it old stuff? What about the technology we teach with? Several years ago, I was asked to go observe a botany professor teach. He was teaching with transparencies. They had a yellow tint to them. And they'd been prepared using the orter type element ball that goes on that IBM selector. Do we consider that our students have changed in our teaching? So my first challenge is that we need to constantly be reevaluating our curriculum, what we're teaching and how we're teaching. Are we ignoring the millennials? Are we teaching to them? Realization number two. Do professors have a brain? Now, as Dorothy was going to find the wizard, she came across this gentleman, and he did not have a brain. He wanted a brain. So do you have a brain? If you had a brain, you might re-examine how we teach. Your feelings of insecurity seem to have started when Mary Lou Gernblatt said, maybe I don't have a learning disability, maybe you have a teaching disability. And that may be true. I won't identify the professor whose class I went in to take that picture. The beat goes on. Research continues to show the traditional lecture methods in which professors talk and students listen continues to dominate in our college classrooms. 
Yet the research on the effectiveness of lecture indicates there are some major issues. But yet that's what we do. In case you don't know, the le word lecture came from the word lectus, which is Latin, which means to read. And this was developed during the Dark Ages. And what we did, we had monasteries, and they would reproduce manuscripts. And you'd have a room full of scribes. There would be a head scribe who would stand behind the scriptorium and read word for word from the manuscript. And each scribe would write down word for word what was said. Then after you read the manuscript, you had 20 other cop you had 20 copies of the manuscript, you'd read those with other monasteries. And that worked great in the Dark Ages. But we're no longer in the Dark Ages. The current book I'm reading is called Teaching Naked. And um, I'll let you think about that for a moment. But the author says some faculty might find the live delivery of instruction more compelling, but the millennial generations, for the most part, does not share that view. Now, they really don't want us to go lecture to them. And further on in the book, he says, ignoring that the world has changed will not impress your students. The best and most common way for students to receive first exposure is now online. Used to, the lecture was the first exposure to the material. But now we can put all the material online so they should get their first exposure online. Listening to a lecture and taking notes is no longer an important skill. Thinking and communication skills will remain critical, but these are hardly enhanced by sitting passively in lecture halls. And you saw those students. So, you know, we need to sort of think about how we teach. If professors had a brain, we would look at characteristics of our students. You know, on the left-hand column is in the old days on how we watched films, listening to music, chatted with friends, reading the news, played music. On the right-hand side, no, that's the way we do it today. You know, most of you are aware there's four generations or a few more, depending upon how you count them. The traditionalists, then we have the baby boomers, and I'm in that generation. Many of us as instructors are in that generation. Then we got the Gen Xs, then we have the millennials, and those are the ones that we're teaching. They're diverse, cyber literate, media savvy, realistic, environmentally conscious, collaborative. So in our teaching, are we building on those characteristics? Are you getting a lot done on the grandpa box? The what? The people in my generation do our work on our phones and tablets. I also have a laptop. I'll text the 90s and let them know. No. So. No, there's a difference in the generations. I just want to call your attention to the right-hand side. The millennials, they work from anywhere and any time. Uh, they always carry their little computer with them. It's also the mobile phone. They share everything. Privacy is not, it's sort of overrated. I'm constantly communicating with others, using technology, texting. No, my generation, email is a great thing. But the current one, texting is the thing. Uh, my employers are lucky I'm working for them. I'm impatient. Don't bother me with long processes. I want relevant and personalized information now. That's what they are. So what do millennials want? Do they want lectures? No. Ah, I've been waiting forever for this stupid web page to load. How long is forever? Oh, around four seconds, I guess. Jeremy, let me explain something to you about patience. Okay, you're almost finished. I'm bored. Nope, those are the millennials. And here's the problem. Most of us university professors are in this category, and we're teaching people in this category. Now, I know there's a few of you in that category there, uh, but we sort of teach the way we were taught. So if we have a brain, we'll have to sort of think about this. If people, professors, had a brain, we would look at course delivery trends. You've heard the old joke about selling ice to Eskimos. Well, now we're selling distance learning services to the Eskimos. The Babson Survey Research Group does work for Sloan Consortium, and they, for the last 10 years, have been doing studies of distance ed. And this is enrollment online compared to total enrollment. And you can see the trend, which way it's going. Here's actually the chart that it's based on. And right here we have annual growth, total enrollment. It's gone down a little bit. The economy. Uh, the question about college degrees, it's not grown much, but distance ed continues to grow. 
the, here is it graphed out. Here is the overall enrollment. It sort of got flat. Distance said it's going up. Online's going up. We asked universities how critical is online for your future. It's going up. This shows 22, 2002 and 2012. The red is online courses and full programs. It's now about two-thirds, and all these are more distance ed. There's only a handful of colleges that don't do online distance learning. My department gets more money by teaching distance ed classes than we get from the state. Uh, it's an entrepreneurial operation. We would not survive if we did not have distance ed. We've been hiring new faculty based on distance ed funding. Here is the shocker of all. In this research from Babson, faculty at my school accept the value and legitimacy of online education. 30% agree. 57% are neutral. 12% disagree. I've been on the faculty senate for the last four years. We discussed distance ed. Many of the professors, oh, that's a fad. It'll go away. You know, the only way students can learn is to sit at my feet. You know, and, and they're the ones that are holding us back, most of the faculty. So I'm sort of preaching to the choir because I know you, you're on the cutting edge here. You aren't one of these mossbacks there. There are some interesting trends out there. If you haven't heard of Khan Academy, uh, you need to. It's free. It's online. Uh, last year they had 3,400 short videos. It's growing. This is the guy that started it. He had a niece in a distant state who was having problems with math. So he would make out little lessons, record himself, put them on YouTube. His niece would then look at them. Then other people found them, and more people found them. And he had a great way of explaining materials or 10-minute videos. And then sure, everybody in the world was going there. Bill Gates learned about it. So he gave him a whole bunch of money. So now it's a huge enterprise. Every month they have more than 6 million unique students go to Khan Academy to learn the material. Some schools have flipped their teaching using Khan Academy. There are some schools in California now. You show up to class, you sit at the computer, you log on to the lesson, and then you do it. The teacher helps you when you have a problem. The students are learning themselves. They're teaching themselves through the Khan Academy. Learners earn badges. You know that horse riding trophy? Well, let's give them badges. The mission is a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Students have found this. This is how they're learning quadratic equations. This is how they're learning math, history, everything. Here are some of their badges, and they now have real-time stats so teachers can actually track their students if they use it. We had a, a ruling passed in North Carolina recently that all students, before they can graduate, must have one online course. That's the program for the future. So what's going to happen when the students in Khan Academy and take an online course and show up at our college and sit in the lecture halls? Maybe interesting. If professors had a brain, you might do a little reading. When was the last time you read a book about teaching or higher education? Well, let me just review a few for you real quick. There's a book that came out in 2010, Higher Education, How Colleges Are Wasting Our Money and Failing Our Kids and What We Can Do About It. Boy, that sounds exciting. This is a scathing indictment of higher ed, tuitions outpacing inflation, professors only want to do research, there's over-reliance on part-time instructors, and the list goes on. They have identify a lot of problems. Academically Adrift came out in 2011. There is a collegiate learning assessment that's supposed to measure your critical thinking, analytical reasoning, other high-level skills taught in college. They looked at 24 universities, 2,300 students. These universities were public, land-grant, privates, the whole gamut. The results are not encouraging. The results found after two years of college, you did not really improve in critical thinking or analytical reasoning. Well, if you sit in a lecture hall all day long, how do you expect to have that happen? And after four years, it was very minimal gain. It was, it was pretty bad. Here's a book called Leaving College. came out last year, Rethinking the Causes and Cures of Student Attrition. 58% of graduating high school seniors attend some type of post-secondary education, 55% never complete. So why aren't they? So they analyze what's going on. Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard, wrote this book recently, Higher Education in America, and he basically defends the academy. He says we're not as bad as everybody says. We're not as bad as all these other books are. But he is concerned about our students acquiring critical thinking, writing, analysis of problem skills. He says it's not happening. We've got to figure out here in a few minutes how to make it happen, folks. 
Zimsky wrote this book, Checklist for Change, Making American Higher Education a Sustainable Enterprise. He says there's four problems. We have a disengaged faculty who are resistant to change. That previous slide sort of indicates that. There's little differentiation in higher education. Everybody wants to be like Harvard. You get a new president, oh, our goal is to you know, move up in the rankings. You know, my goal is to be a land-grant college. And we need to remember that. Accreditation and regulatory processes that punishes innovation. Now, whenever I want to do something of this and that, I've got to get the permission of the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools because they accredited us. And then he says the curriculum lacks cohesion. Many question it. But the most interesting book is Zombies in the Academy. That just came out. And Donna, that's written by some Aussies. Yes. The authors find zombies lurking around every corner. Students concerned solely with getting through and making the grade. Faculty members deadened by the, organ, the corporization of the university and the erosion of traditional faculty jobs. You know, things that are no longer relevant. So, you know, you might want to go read Zombies in the Academy. So do professors read? The American Bookseller Association says the average business person reads less than one book a year. Yet, the average chief officer of Fortune 500 company reads 6.7 books per year. You know, and uh, some of you may have heard of Larry Cuban. He owns the Dallas Mavericks. And he does a lot of reading. He's a voracious reader. And some years ago, he read something called High Definition Television. He said, you know, this sounds like a good idea. I think I will get in on this. And he wouldn't have learned that unless he was reading so my question is, how many do you read? You now, if you have a brain, you might want to read some of these. Here's a book I recently read, Teaching at Its Best. It's a real good book on teaching. Well, if professors had a brain, what else might we do? We might do research on our teaching. I currently have a study underway. Do students in distance ed classes really want student-to-student -student interaction? The literature says they do, but this is basically philosophical. Yeah, that's good. I work with adults. Some of them say, you know, I don't have time to mess with that stuff. So I'm surveying every student who's had a distance ed course from my department in the last three years. There's 234 of them. Within 24 hours of sending out the survey, I had a 25% response rate. They registered their thoughts. And it may turn the academy upside down. No. So it's interesting. I've done some recent studies on electronic responders in the classroom. Does it Free student learning. Why do students enroll in distance ed classes to start with? Are they easier than college on campus classes? We've looked at distance delivery modes and the impact it has on higher order discussions. So you now if we're teaching classes, we're doing distance education, let's have some comparison groups. Let's collect data. Let's publish it. So we should be doing research on our teaching. So my second challenge, if we had a brain, we would look at the characteristics of our students and how they impact learning. We would read books about higher education and teaching. We would study to become better teachers. We would conduct teaching research. We would challenge our students to read and write more. Academically, a drift finds our students don't read much. They don't write much. But they write a lot you know, with their thumbs. Uh, but they aren't writing in academics. Oh, let's not play the video. Let's go to this. You're nothing but a great big coward. Dorothy trying to find the Wizard of Oz across the coward line. And he didn't have any courage. He wasn't willing to try something new. So my question is, do you have the courage to try something new? It's easy to do the same old things. Man, boy, once I get this printed, it's ready to go. It's ready to go forever. If we try something new, it might fail or it may not work. This fall marks my 40th year of walking into a college classroom as the instructor. I have taught college longer than some of you have been alive. And so it's real easy for me to say, well, I'll just sort of teach the way I used, that I've always been taught. I'm a boomer, so I'll teach like all my students are boomers. They're not. So I've had to try to do some things. So I'm going to challenge you to have courage. 
Let's have true confessions. Now, there's this magazine. I hate small group work. I literally hate it. Now, I'm from the generation, if it's to be, it's up to me. No, I'll do it on my own. No, I don't need small group work. And some years ago, I tried it. It did not work. So that was the end of it. But then I keep reading about the millennials. They want to collaborate. They want to work together. So I sort of had that in the back of my mind. I've read the literature. It says, yeah, we need to be doing small group work. I have a challenging course. Here is True Confessions. I teach every spring an undergraduate course in computer applications. Ag Ed has to take it. Extension Ed has to take it. Ag Business Management has to take it. Agricultural and Environmental Technology has to take it. And some other students show up. The course, what do I teach? I teach how to design web pages, how to use social media, how to use Microsoft Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and Photoshop. And it was originally designed for teachers. Here's how to use these technologies in your teaching. But there's some issues in teaching this course because I have all these different majors. The ag business management, they don't care about teaching. Uh, a lot of students grew up with technology, so they think they already know how to do it. Well, they know how to do it. They just don't know how to do it correctly. Uh, then this is sort of a subject-centered approach. Here's Excel. Here's what it does. Here's how to do it. That's the way I've always taught it. And I spent a lot of time grading projects. Every student had to develop a website. Every student had to do this. Every student had to do that. I was killing myself grading. So what am I supposed to do? And at our university, I hate to show you this slide, that we have a course evaluation form. One of the questions is, overall, this course was excellent. 3.2 on a five-point scale, and I won some teaching awards. Now, give me a break. 3.4. Now, there's another question. Overall, the instructor is wonderful. I get good ratings on that, but I get terrible ratings on this course. I said, things got to change, folks. We got to do something different. I'm not doing it right. So I'll have the courage to do something different. So why not try a problem-focused approach with a lot of formal, small group activity? So I'll go back and do the things I hate to do. So I divided the class into four teams. I was teaching in the computer lab. There's 24 seats in the computer lab, six on the team. Each class period, I started with a problem scenario, and then the group projects replaced individual projects. And here's a sample problem scenario. Second day of class, we talk about file management, how to use Google Drive, how to use Dropbox, where to put your files. So I had some various scenarios with people who had lost files and how, what the solution was. Then here's the way the students sit in the class. I said, okay, we're going to divide them up in teams. And I had some guidelines. I didn't want to isolate a gender. I didn't want to have one girl in a group of all guys. I didn't want to have one guy in a group of all girls. I wanted to put a weaker student in between a stronger student. Now here's O. Andrew, 1.69 GPA. Uh, this student has a better GPA. This student has a better GPA. So I, so I put the weak students in between. Then I had a couple of students, this girl here, this guy here. No, they were suffering. So I, I get to walk on that end of the room. So I put them so I could get to them quicker. And uh, I put these six students together. They're all ag ed majors. And then I put these six students together. They're all extension education majors. I put these six together. They're all ag business majors. And then these were the leftovers. So they just all got lumped together, animal science and everything else. So, you know, I had gender specific, mixed gender, same majors, different majors. And I said, well, I'm going to do some experimental research while I'm doing this. Great trial. So every group is told you have to assume an identity. You have to be a corporation, an organization. So this group of girls, the Ag Ed girls, wanted to be Hillsborough High School. Hillsborough is the street that runs by the campus. This group of students wanted to be Moorland Cooperative Extension. I guess they thought if they used my name, I would give them extra credit for it. This group said they wanted to be Carolina Equipment. And I learned after the semester's over, this kid right there was graduating, ag business major. He was going to go work for a equipment dealership. Then this group here, the mixed over is the Hidden Valley Ranch. That's what they wanted to be. And okay, so here's their first project. They developed the website, had to have six pages in it. You know, and so there's the Hillsborough High School. Here's the Moreland Extension. Here's the Case Dealership. Each student took on a role in the dealership. Here's the Hidden Valley Ranch, and what's interesting, they say it's located in South Park, Wyoming. So, <laughs> no, 
So, no, they're, they're getting out of town there. So each group developed, you know, a website. And they had to develop a website, counted 10% of the grade. They had to do a social media campaign, a newsletter and brochure, Excel spreadsheet, PowerPoint. 30% of the grade was off the group projects. And then we had a system called the auto rating system. So whenever you have a group project, you rate everybody else on what their contributions was to the group. Um, and if you just Google auto rating, you'll find this. Uh, but some students who don't work real hard in a group, they get lower grades. If you work real, real hard, you get a higher grade on whatever the group project grade is. So what did I learn from this? Well, the more diverse group, the better it clicked. You know, these six students who are from everything, man, they really worked good. If a student missed a class or was having a problem, the other team members brought the student up to speed. In the past, I'd have to spend a lot of time talking with students. Here's what you missed. Now the team helps the other team. They communicate together outside of class. Overall, the assignments were higher. And I didn't have to grade as much. So, now this is a good idea. Then at the end of the semester, you got a 4.1. So, hey, we're, we're moving in the right direction on the quality of the course. So, you know, I had the courage to try to do group projects again, even though I was against it. But the research on millennials says, oh, this is what we should be doing. You may have heard the term clipping the class. I teach a graduate class that looks at the history of agriculture. I have a lesson on the land-grant college movement. And in the past, I would put videos and recordings, readings online. Penn State has a great video. Uh, Iowa State has a great video on land-grant colleges. Vermont Public Broadcasting has a Justin Morrell video that's really good. And I hope students would read those and watch the videos before class. Then during class, I would do the traditional PowerPoint get up, lecture, I would have electronic responders, we'd have questions and discussions, we'd have a group activity, but it's primarily lecture. And then after class, I would have a narrated version of the PowerPoint posted online. And that's the way I would teach. But after reading, teaching naked, I taught this lesson last week. Here's what we did. The videos and readings were still online. The narrated PowerPoint was posted in advance. The students were expected to do all this before they come to class. So then when they get to class, what do we do? Well, we think. We discuss. The first thing I did, I came dressed in in light blue academic regalia, whole doctoral garb. And if anybody knows anything about North Carolina, we have the University of North Carolina, the Liberal Arts College. We have North Carolina State University, the Land Grant College. We're 25 miles apart. And I came in dressed as a professor from the University of North Carolina. Not just a professor, I came dressed as the president. Most people don't realize this, but the University of North Carolina was the original land-grant college. And they had it for 20 years before it was revoked. Why was it revoked? Well, we had a discussion about that. So, you know, I led the class in the discussion. Boy, it got heated. Man, they got mad at President Battle. So then I left the room, came back in wearing coveralls. I was the president of the Grange, and I wanted to talk to them about that thing at UNC and how it's a travesty, and it's not a real land-grant college. So we had a discussion from the farmer's perspective. And then we met as the inaugural board of trustees for the initial land-grant college. What happens, North Carolina State was established because UNC blew it as a land-grant college. So as the board of trustees, what do you do? Well, I don't know what to do. Who's going to be your president? What's the, what's the admission requirements? So, boy, we had a real good discussion on that. Then finally we debated, is NCSU still a land-grant college? Or are we trying to be too much like Harvard? And, yeah, you get some real learning going on over there. Now, I don't have to spend all class introducing materials. So let me just throw out a few ideas of some things you might want to do different. In this conference, there's going to be a whole bunch of good sessions on things you can do. So some of my ideas, actively involve students in the teaching learning process. You know that. That's nothing new. In other words, don't just lecture. I use clickers in my classroom. I use those from turning technologies. And about every five minutes, I ask a question. You know, if you've got to answer a question every five minutes, it's a little harder to go to sleep. And I've actually had some grants to try this out throughout the college. And boy, the course evaluations in some programs have improved dramatically. Uh, we had a biotechnology professor who got terrible ratings after she went using clickers. 
just went off the top. And I told her you had to ask a question every five minutes. And you know, if you had clickers or not, it doesn't matter. If you ask a question every five minutes and get some discussion, that helps. I have buzzer systems. We have competitions and classes. This is a crop science class at the University of Illinois. The speaker's throwing out questions. You buzz in to see who's first. You keep score. The students sort of like that. Uh, you probably heard of death by PowerPoint. Well, I use Prezi. It's an alternative to PowerPoint. Presentations will be linear and non-flowing. I would have done that today, but you might have got a seasick because I have a lot of motion in my Prezi's. So if you don't know about Prezi, you might want to sort of bone up on it and figure out how to use it. Here's a presentation one of my students did using Prezi. You might want to think about using geocaching. People go throughout the country hiding stuff. And then they go on this website, and they put up information about what they've hid, and they give you coordinates. I was speaking at the University of Alberta a couple summers ago, and I was in the Crown Plaza Hotel, and there's something called Urban Eden. Well, that sounded interesting. So I clicked on it, and this is about a community garden. I like horticulture, so I thought, well, I'll go see if I can find this. And it gives more information about the community garden. Here's the coordinates. I put that. I always carry my GPS with me. So I put that coordinates in there. I went outside the hotel. I had to go that direction, 0.19 miles. So I took off, and here's what I found. Oh, there's downtown Alberta, our urban Eden, and here's the community garden. So basically, I learned all about their community gardening program, and I was really trying to find a geocache. And the geocache was in this little box under this tree here. So I did find the geocache. If you find a geocache, you're supposed to swap out stuff. So I got this the other day at Virginia Tech. So before I leave town, I might leave it here. But, but there's trinkets in these geocaches, so you take them out. I have a geocache at my house. It's called Gnome Sweet Home. Uh, and I have a little nature area in my place. There's 20 trees with interpretive signage and a small fish pond. And when you find this thing right here, you're close. What is that thing right there? A tulip tree. So what happens, they would come to my place, and because of the tree canopy, they have a hard time finding it. So, oh, I'm walking around. Oh, there's that name. So this is a yellow poplar, also called a tulip tree. They read all about it. And you can sort of see in the background, oh, that looks like some gnomes, something. So here's a, a picture. Here's another picture. The geocache is hidden behind that door right there. No, it's a container in there. And then, you know, here's the black gum. I have signage on those 20 trees. So people come, they'll spend an hour learning about trees. And so I, I'm an educator and I believe in education. You can use this in your class. Have students come up with unique trees on campus, soil profiles. Here's a neat soil profile. Historical sites. We have fistulated cows at our university. Well, I give GPS coordinates on how to find the fistulated cows if you want to find a fistulated cow. No, we're supposed to be educating people. How many geocaches are here in Laramie? A lot. But, but here's a map uh, of the geocaches right around here. One of them has pine seeds. Coniferous pinus is the name of the catch. Uh, some of them aren't very fancy. Some are real hard. One of the most frustrating ones is this one right here. I was here two years ago. This is at the fairgrounds. I went to an event at the fairgrounds. I spent 30 minutes trying to find that geocache. I couldn't find it. Went to the function. I came back, and I searched, and I searched, and I searched. Where is this geocache? And I stood right here. I was right on the coordinates. Can anybody see a geocache? No, they're real tricky. See that reflector right there? It swivels. You swivel it up, and there's a hole behind it that has that geocache. And so, no, we might, you might think about using geocaching. I was going to run away from home, but they wouldn't let me have the GPS. Poor kid. Uh, you might see a little yellow button up there. That's Jing. That's a program where if you see anything on your screen you want to capture it, you just click on that, draw a box around it and capture it. And then you can annotate it, write stuff. So here's a picture I got of a swayback horse. I want to make sure the students know where the swayback is. And I use this a lot with my distance ed students. I say, I just can't get this to work. I'll take a picture of the screen using Jing. Say, press on this button right here and draw an arrow to it. 
This is a QR code. If you don't know what they are, you need to. I teach a class on how to use technology in teaching. They come into class and say, the topic tonight are QR codes. You have one hour to prepare your report. Go to it. And you have to develop an application. So that's what I'm going to do to you. I'm not going to tell you what they are. But you can use these as powerful teaching tools. So you need to Google it, figure it out, find a QR code generator, and these QR codes can take you a lot of places. I bought some flocks the other day at Home Depot. It's got a QR code on it. And uh, it's real interesting when you click on that QR code to see what happens. Uh, there are several sites where you can take words and it creates a word map. Um, well, it would be interesting if you took your course evaluations and plugged them in there, what word map would come out. The words that show the biggest are the ones that are used the most. Make your students movie stars. They like to be creative. Give them digital cameras. Instead of writing a paper, have them produce a documentary for your class. Upload them to YouTube. I have a 32-year-old son. He makes $3,000 a month off of advertising of videos he puts on YouTube. So that's, I'd never think, here's the way to make money. He quit his job. All he does is make YouTube videos and gets avenue revenue from that. So you can make movies. <clears throat> Bloom's Taxonomy has different levels of thinking. Here's the new one using technology. You know, creating is at the very top. So I have students make documentaries. So my third challenge is have the courage to try new approaches to teaching. Now, make it your goal this year to try one new approach, new technology. Show the millennials that you're cool. We need to have a heart. The forgot to get me a No heart, no heart. Well, the tin smith did not have a heart. It's great to have technology. It's great to do all these wonderful, cool things. But as teachers, we have to have heart. Why do I have to sit up front all the time? Because you can't behave yourself like Todd Burris. Who's he? Uh, that's me. Uh, how long have you been sitting behind me? Since kindergarten. So what did you learn in school today? That good behavior makes you invisible. Here is a picture of me as a young boy. And uh, that's my mother. There's my oldest brother, next oldest brother, younger brother. If you were a detective, what could you deduce from looking at that set of photos about my upbringing? Rural, poor. There's no father in the picture. He ran away when I was 20 months old. So I never knew my father. Uh, we had central heat because that's where the wood-burning stove set. Uh, no, it's pretty, pretty poor. And this was in central Texas. That's the outhouse. Used that till I was in fourth grade. And I wore hand-me-down clothes from a well-to-do cousin in Austin. The coveralls my brothers were wearing, it wasn't the fashion statement. That was it. Yeah, they had two pair, one for Sunday school and church, and one for the rest of the week. I made pretty good grades. I was not a member of the in crowd. I was pretty much invisible. Until a teacher saw potential in me and encouraged me. His name was Jack Lacey. He was a high school ag teacher. Otherwise, my life would have been entirely different. But a teacher made the difference. I enrolled in Ag Ed, joined the FFA. He said, if you learn the creed, you get this pin. I'd never won anything in my life. I learned that creed. I won that pin. If you're the star green hen, you get a flock of sheep for a year. So I got the flock of sheep for a year. And uh, I got to keep all the lambs except two when the next star green hen got it. 
And then he said, there's other degrees you can earn. So I worked on those degrees. I learned some leadership skills. I learned public speaking. I went on exchange trips. I'd never seen silage until I went to Missouri. I received scholarships to college because of being in the FFA. When I went to college, my mother gave me $20. That was her contribution to my college career. And that was more than she could afford. Uh, but this teacher sort of opened the doors. Then I became a high school ag teacher. A lot of people thought I was teaching ag, but I was really looking for those invisible kids. And each kid that circled, I could tell you a story. And we have them in our college classes also. A course that I teach every semester, the first week the students have to introduce themselves and tell of a, a more memorable teacher. Last week, one of my students said, what got me to where I am today was taking an introductory hardcore class with Pro Professor Bryce Lane just to fill some space in my class schedule. When I first came to NCSU, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. After taking this class, I changed my major. Bryce has heart. He cares for students. He is an outstanding teacher. And so she goes on. I got this email a while back out of the clear blue. This kid named Ken Foster wrote it. He was professor and interim head of ag economics at Purdue. And in here he said he was interviewing for the department head's job, and he got to thinking about what got him to where he was. And he mentioned me. I don't remember Ken Foster. He walked in the door. I would not remember him. But yet, I made an impact on his life. So my challenge to you is to search out those invisible students that you have in your class and make them visible. We have superstars. We know them. We have some that are troublemakers, and we know them, but we don't know the middle ones. And so I try to go to class every day early to talk with students, find out what they like, what they don't like, what's going on in their lives. Um, so my challenge, even though we want to use technology, we want to be good teachers, we have to have heart. Students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Henry Brooks Adams says a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. And the more time I spend in higher education, the more I realize this is a truism. Oh, let's see what Realization 5 is. Folks, there is no Wizard of Oz. No, that's just the man hiding behind a curtain. And I guess you're just going to have to assume that role yourself in your classroom. You're going to have to be the Wizard of Oz in your class. You need to use technology. You need to have courage to change. Um, so. <laughs> I think we have a few minutes for questions. I'll be glad to entertain any. Yes. I have not experienced So the group are breaking up into small groups. Uh, I see how you have done it, but it has been a challenge to do it in my class because they more than like their discipline, they like to team up with their friends. And when I try to say, no, this is how groups are going to be formed, there's big resistance there. What is the easy, or what, what methods? I, I don't give that option. I form the groups before the class ever meets. Is that and I have name tags sitting at the desk. Find your name tag, sit there, introduce yourself to your groups. And we just start it from the get-go. They never know any different. And some might say, well, I'd rather work for that. Well, this is what we're going to do, and there's a reason for it. And some of us teach uh, mixed classes with graduate and undergraduate. Is it better to put the graduates separate from one, or is it better to fix them up? I don't have a feeling one way or the other. I see advantages of doing it both ways. Maybe somebody in here can 
provide enlightenment on that. I, I don't know which is the best. I really like to mix up the branches, the branches, and then I do mix them sometimes. Okay. We form the group. Yeah. Uh, it just kind of depends. Yeah. That, that, that's my thinking. Uh, I, I found every group you want two or three real strong ones, they'll bring the other people around. And, and then they're, they're more critical. Oh, this isn't good enough. You know, let's, you know they're worse than my mother. No, yeah. good. no they're, they're good. Do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to know if you the same groups for the entire semester. Yeah. The, the whole, whole groups are the same semester. They even meet together outside of classroom time. I give them time in class to work on these assignments. But they meet outside of classroom. They have Google Hangouts. This past week, I had three students all across the state in the distance head class in the Google Hangout designing a research study. And so... No, it's, they like doing stuff, and even though I hated it, but now I'm embracing it. <laughs> I'm going to get better. I um, just to say there's a website called Team-Based Learning Collaborative, and it has phenomenal resources and ideas of how to make groups according to equal distribution of characteristics, whatever the characteristics might be that you're looking for. Really helpful website. Team-based learning collaborative. Do you have any courses that you teach online only where you don't see the students? Yeah. So how do you get um, either group activities or effective discussion with large numbers? You're probably stoning me. I don't. Uh, well, I sort of do. We have forums. Exchange of ideas. The research I'm doing most of my distance ed students are not the uh, millennials. They're a little older. And they say, I have families. I have professional friends. I don't need new friends. I want the material. <laughs> I really don't want to interact with each other. And it's really blowing, blowing us away, the three of us that are doing this research study. You know, this group of learners that are doing distance ed solely, there's a reason. I, I have students on campus taking the distance ed class. So they don't want to do that other stuff. They just want the material. They want to get on with their life. So, so I don't try to force them into something. We, we have minimal interaction dealing with requirements. I want to know who else is in the class. I'll post a question from time to time. But it's not like every week you must react to three postings and do this and do that. Okay. Our, our research says one of our questions on our survey, no. If I was not required as a class grade to do this, would I do it? No, they would not. How much tech support do you have? I am a boomer. I do it myself. I started teaching distance ed in 1998. I took a six-month sabbatical. I went and learned HTML coding. And then they came out with <laughs> the editors. And uh, we use a program at our university called Moodle. It's a learning management system. And uh, I go to some workshops from time to time to learn how to do different things, like how to use a grade book in Moodle. And there's tech support there if I ask for it. But you do it all yourself? Yes. Yeah. I do it myself. That's an interesting question because last night I have a lady who sent me an email said I'm having problems logging in <laughs> and I said are you being sensitive to case sensitivity. No. And that is the problem. And I, I, I have very little problem with students having tech problems. There's some, but not, not, not much. It's pretty simple stuff. Uh, do you have any secrets to share on how you can get other faculty that maybe, you know, to take that leap and try that one thing in their classes that you work with? That you've been able to convince? A um, couple of things, two disparate answers. First, on doing distance education, you saw that one slide where a lot of faculty do not embrace it. We have some departments 
on our college campus where there's three or four faculty who do distance ed and the rest of them don't. Uh, in my department, every faculty member teaches at least one distance ed class. Uh, we've made it a requirement. It's written in all the, the job descriptions. And uh, so our faculty have bought into it, so they see the need for it. And then on getting people to try new and different things, uh, my department puts on a two and a half day teaching boot camp uh, that we do every summer, either at the end of the semester or at the start of the new year. We have new faculty come to it. And then I teach a course uh, called Effective Teaching in Ag and Life Sciences. It's a graduate course for TAs uh, in animal science, horticulture, and other areas. And so a lot of times a TA will take the course, go back to the instructor they're working with, and bring about change that way. <laughs> so. I'd be curious in the research you're talking about with the interaction. One tool that I found actually works better than the discussion boards after doing focus groups on our online courses. Oh, that's good. Focus group is the synchronous chat, usually a text, sometimes video. Where it's real time interaction with the instructor and the class. And yeah. In our department, each professor does have they want to do it. We have some do synchronous, some do asynchronous. We have one professor who makes extensive use of Google Hangouts, and he's there at certain times. The students are there. He has certain different groups. I've had some students come to me and they say, I don't want to take this course because it's synchronous. I don't want to be someplace at 6 o'clock on Monday afternoon. So, you, know, you sort of got to look at the, what the students want. And I think often we don't ask students what they want. They are challenging, but it can be done. Um, you know, the largest class I typically teach is 50 to 60, and I can make it work from 50 to 60. We do have some of our professors who have the big 200 seat classes, and uh, they do uh, more informal group activities than the formal group activities. But, uh, that's a challenge. One more question. Um, are there any students who are disappointed that there is so much technology they expect to learn the old way and in your course evaluations they expect a whole slightly lecture and this way of learning is not working for them? Do they make any comments like that? No, I, I teach two, probably two different groups of students. We teach every course, just about every course, live on campus. We teach it by distance ed. So you can pick and choose whichever one you want. And I have some students that float back and forth, uh, depending on what the topic for the night is. For the millennials, the undergraduates, that computer course, I communicate by tweeting. The adults, I communicate by email. And uh, now I, I uh, try to have a lot of variety. One of the things I've learned, good teaching is good teaching regardless if it's millennials, baby boomers, or what else. There's certain things that work good for everybody. And the thing that I've learned is enthusiasm and variety. Do a lot of different things. Different students have different learning styles. So I'll have optional assignments. So you pick and choose what you think works best for you. And uh, so it's a lot of variety that I don't really have a problem with. People who want to be bored to death. Lecture for three hours, would you please? <laughs> Okay. All right, let's thank you.
So that way, everybody has to be a...